Dungeons and Dragons. Some claim it's a simple, harmless game. Yet suicides, murders, and robberies have been linked to this game. Pat Pulling explains what happened to her son, a victim of Dungeons and Dragons. He died because he became too involved with the game Dungeons and Dragons. He, his personality became one with the character that he was living at the time in the game. And uh, he took his life because of the scenario he was playing at the time he died. Dungeons and Dragons emphasizes black and white witchcraft. It creates a world of fear and death. Dr. Gary North says Dungeons and Dragons is the most effectively, most magnificently packaged, most profitably marketed, the most thoroughly researched introduction to the occult in man's recorded history. The books, the games, the toys, the TV all seem to have the same origin. Throughout society, a web seems to be woven to initiate and educate the unsuspecting into the world of the occult. The influence casts an alarming shadow over our culture. The potential exists to deceive a generation. This influence raises important questions. What will happen to the world if it loses its youth? What will happen to parents if they lose their children? What will happen to children if they lose their soul? Tabletop RPGs have been a huge part of pop culture since the release of Dungeons and Dragons in 1974. Players formed clubs and organized events, even teachers used the game as part of education programs. But there has also been many misconceptions about these games over the decades. There were instances of young people committing suicide and parents were quick to point at tabletop RPGs as the cause. Parent groups around the United States petitioned school boards to ban the games, and the religious claimed that they encouraged devil worship and suicide. In the 80s, a group called Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons was leading the crusade against tabletop RPGs. The group was made up of parents, teachers and clergy who were worried about the spiritual and mental development of children. Believing that D&D corrupted children, they campaigned against the game, warning parents and speaking out in media. While dwindling in numbers, there are people still today who claim that tabletop RPGs cause mental illness, violent behavior, and even Satanism. In truth, there's plenty of research indicating strong benefits of playing tabletop RPGs, and the games are even used in education and therapy. This video offers a comprehensive look at the history of tabletop RPGs with a focus on the D&D scare during the Satanic Panic, a crusade based on misinformed views and religious fanaticism. I'll start by giving an explanation of the hobby and its history, since that will be important to understand the context behind the panic. I will then talk about the panic itself, how it came to be, and how it ties to tabletop RPGs. Finally, I'll address what happened to the panic over time, and how it may have actually helped the growth of the hobby in the end. A green eyeball was seen up in the sky. This eyeball was so big it blotted out the sun, okay? These young people are playing Dungeons & Dragons. It's an enormously complicated game in which each player chooses an imaginary character he'll assume. There are dwarfs, knights and thieves, gods and devils, magic and spells. It's a journey into a land of fantasy through complicated mazes where you use your wits to kill your enemies before they kill you, all in a quest for wealth and power. The dungeon master orchestrates and referees the game, creating scenarios both complicated and terrifying. There is no board, only the dice. I've, I've never seen dice like these. They're all different sides. What's exciting? What's the what's the point in that? What, what's the... they're for uh, different things. The four sided is used mainly for damage from a dagger and dart, and magic users hit points. Hit points is the damage that you can take before you die. I did mention the game Dungeons and Dragons, which was published by Gary Gygax and Dave Arnson in 1974. However, the game's origins date back even further than that. Gygax and Arnson came from the then popular wargaming genre and wanted to create a game that provided more creative and character focused experiences. Wargames at the time were often complex simulation games with origins as early as the 19th century when Prussian soldiers used them to teach military strategy. In these games, two opponents faced each other using miniature armies and their knowledge of military tactics. 
In the Prussian army, a senior officer oversaw the simulation and determined what the results of a maneuver would be, often relying on complex mathematical calculations. It's believed that the Prussian's military victory over France in 1870 was in part due to the use of war games. It was first in the early 20th century when war games aimed for the public were published. They became increasingly popular and in the 1960s there was a thriving wargaming community in the United States. Some of the issues with these games at the time were that since there wasn't an impartial referee anymore overseeing the game, players often bickered over rules. The games were also often designed for only two players while taking up a lot of space and they took hours to play. One of the first attempts to transition from war game to role playing game was with the experimental game Brownstein made by David Wesley in the 1960s. He wanted a more cooperative experience and decided to incorporate additional players that took on different roles. He used a Napoleonic war game called the Siege of Bodenburg and gave two players the roles of opposing commanders. The other players took civilian roles such as banker and major. Wesley gave each role objectives and goals and then set himself as the referee. However, the game rapidly devolved into chaos as the players were more unpredictable than he had expected. Ultimately, Wesley was disappointed, but many of the players loved it. One of these players was Dave Arnson, who, inspired by Brownstein, came to design his own game Blackmore, a game where university students were sucked into a medieval fantasy world. Blackmore could be played as a campaign where players continued their story over multiple sessions. Arnson went on to add rules for improving skills so that characters could get stronger over time. He also wanted to take combat away from the battlefield and make it more personal. So he experimented with new locations, including enclosed spaces such as castles and sewers. These indoor environments became known as dungeons. Gary Gygax first played the Siege of Bodenburg at Gen Con in 1968, and he went on to modify the game into a medieval-themed war game called Chainmail, based on an initial design made by an early associate named Jeff Perrin. They released the game in 1969, and it became popular enough that Gygax published a fantasy supplement the following year, introducing creatures from popular fantasy novels such as J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. He also added rules for individual characters called heroes who had a major impact on the battles. Arnson incorporated elements of Shane Mail into Blackmore and after he and Gygax met at Gen Con in 1972 they began to collaborate on game designs. Gygax founded a company called Tactical Studies Rules, later TSR Hobbies, and the two went on to design the initial rules for Dungeons and Dragons. Your dungeon master has placed you in a dreadfully precarious position. You're playing the most phenomenal game ever created. Your skin grows cold from your first glimpse of the enormous beast. It's a product of your imagination. Survival depends on a quick, decisive move. Your choices are limited. Stand and fight, or run. Use your lightning bolt. Victory is yours. Win the treasure! TSR Hobbies. Dungeons and Dragons games. Products of your imagination. In 1974, they printed and sold a thousand copies. In 1975, they sold 4,000. The game had a slow start, one reason likely being that all the equipment needed to play the game weren't provided when buying the prepackaged set. Another problem was that the rules were very complex for amateurs. A journalist at the time had written that the game was only marginally less complicated than a Ptolemaic analysis of planetary motion. Eventually, the game would find its audience in college students and military personnel. By 1979, there would be an estimated 300,000 players and TSR would gross $2 million. These profits multiplied the following years with 8.5 million in 1980 and an estimated 20 million in 1981. The company that makes the Dungeons and Dragons material is TSR Incorporated of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. They estimate there are three to four million kids who play the game. Last year, they grossed nearly $30 million with Dungeons and Dragons books and paraphernalia accounting for most of those sales. Tabletop RPGs became a subculture with conventions and supplemental books were published that offered additional rules and settings. In 1989, there were over 300 different tabletop RPGs on the market. TSR Hobbies was plagued with legal disputes and changed hands several times, but the game itself continued to grow in popularity. In 1983, CBS even produced a cartoon based on the game. 
1997, a major distribution error, combined with heavy investment in a failed game, caused the company to nosedive, and their competitor, Wizards of the Coast, acquired it. They were later purchased by Hasbro. As of June 2022, Dungeons & Dragons is reported to have around 50 million players worldwide. One of the very first articles about D&D was from Los Angeles Times on July 11, 1979, entitled Dungeons and Dragons – Fantasy Life in a Game Without End. The article described the game as incredibly complex, where many players were university students or intellectually gifted children and teenagers. It also mentioned that the game caused players to invest significant amounts of time and money. There wasn't much controversy surrounding D&D at the time the article was published, but quotes from interviewed players pointed out that because the game allows you to do what you want, some had explored violent and sexual themes. One person was quoted saying, D&D is an escape, an outlet for aggression, it's an ego trip, everything you could want. One especially noteworthy incident was on August 15, 1979 when 16-year-old James Dallas Egbert III disappeared from his dorm room at Michigan State University, leaving behind a note saying, To whom it may concern, should my body be found, I wish to be cremated. His parents offered a $5,000 reward to anyone with information about his location. Seven days later, they hired a private investigator named William Deere, who was a former Florida Highway Patrolman and a former Cult D programmer. Deere discovered that Egbert had recently been exposed to D&D and was part of a role-playing club that played a live-action version of the game in the underground steam tunnels of Michigan State University. He theorized that Egbert had lost himself in a game and become delusional, unable to differentiate reality from fiction. At one point he even speculated that someone else, a mysterious dungeon master, could have influenced the boy and used him in a real-life game. While it was known that Egbert struggled mentally and physically, there were no links that tied his disappearance or mental illness in general to D&D. He used recreational drugs like PCP and allegedly struggled with coming to terms with his sexual identity, being an MSU's gay counsel. Dare ignored all those details, instead focusing entirely on the link to D&D. The media went all in on this theory with headlines such as Game Cultist Still Missing, Fantasy Turn Real Life May Have Killed Student, and Dungeons and Dragons Cult May Lead to Missing Boy. Egbert was found several weeks later with no signs of D&D related instability. Instead, what had happened on the night of his disappearance was that he had entered the steam tunnels underneath the university, bringing with him methaqualone, a hypnotic sedative, with the intention of overdosing. He survived the attempt, but instead of returning home, he went into hiding at a friend's house. Egbert then continued to travel for several weeks, staying with acquaintances. Eventually, he ended up in New Orleans, where he tried to poison himself again. After also failing this time, he decided to contact his family. Despite the truth coming out, the media still decided to run articles into the following year about how Egbert was a victim of D&D. The boy eventually took his own life on August 18, 1980, and it was clear that the suicide had been caused by severe loneliness and depression. Years after the Dallas Egbert case, and despite knowing that it had nothing to do with D&D, William Dare wrote a memoir called The Dungeon Master that was a romanticized and exaggerated account of the investigation, where he painted himself as a cool under pressure hero and made up events that never occurred. Even though he had admitted in a press release after the investigation that D&D was unrelated to the case, and that he believed that media had seriously misrepresented the steam tunnel incident, he still turned the game into a key focus for his book. I am the maze control, the god of this universe I have created, the absolute authority. Only I know the perilous course which you are about to take. Your fate is in my hands. I am Glacia the Fighter. I have great strength and courage, strong armor, many weapons, and I have won the mighty talking sword of Loth. I am Freelic, the frenetic of Blossomir, the cleverest of all sprites. Not so strong, with enough tricks and powers to take me far and keep me safe. I am Pardieu, a holy man. In reaching the ninth level, I have acquired many magic spells and charms, the greatest of which is the Graven Eye of Timur. But I also have a sword, which I only use should my magic fail me. There's a wasteland of gnarled hills covered with withered trees and dried grass. 
Beneath these hills is the entrance to the forbidden mazes of the Generac. It is rumored that within these mazes lives mutated people. Once human, they are now unspeakably vicious. It is also known that there are wondrous treasures within these mazes for those brave and clever enough to find them. Thus warned, shall ye enter. Aye. Let the journey begin. Author Rona Jaffe was inspired by the newspaper accounts of the case, took some of William Dare's concepts and wrote a best-selling novel named Mazes and Monsters. The book became popular enough to be made into a film starring a very young Tom Hanks. Though Rona Jaffe did take a more balanced approach in her book and even presented some positive aspects of role-playing, she still shared the perception that D&D could be linked to delinquency and vices. However, while cases such as the Dallas Egbert one had caused people to start linking D&D to mental illness, there was also a growing idea that the game was connected to Satanism. The 1970s may have seen the birth of D&D, but it had also seen a steady rise in America's fear of brainwashing and cults. The Cold War, movies like The Manchurian Candidate and new studies in psychology helped turn brainwashing into a trigger word throughout the United States. Many feared that communist states or other groups they deemed evil were trying to secretly control their youth. Parents were suspicious of things they didn't understand, including the games their children played. People believed that there were criminal networks operating at all levels of society, from high-level politicians to ordinary teenage pranksters. These performed occult rituals with human sacrifice to destroy anything humanity perceived as moral or good. Tabletop RPGs, such as D&D, were considered one of the most effective and ingenious tools for spreading this kind of Satanism. The entire premise of this Satanic Panic, also called the Satanic Ritual Abuse Panic, was created on fictitious conspiracy theories, a mass hysteria and the purest case of moral panic. And it wasn't just the general public that was affected. Therapists, police officers, psychologists and child protection workers all believed in these organized cults and that people infiltrated childcare centers and preschools to abuse children in debased rituals. A survey from Red Book magazine showed that 70% of Americans believed in these satanic cults and a third believed that authorities purposely ignored them. In total, this panic would result in over 12,000 accusations. While there were occasional cases of individual abusers using occult trappings, there was no evidence of an organized satanic cult who engaged in such abuse. But why was this a thing to begin with? There were primarily three contributing factors. First, there was the increased awareness of child sexual abuse. Second, there was the fear over cults and Satanism. And third, there were questionable advancements in psychology. The first factor, as mentioned, was the increased awareness of child sexual abuse. This was a topic that no one really spoke about in the 70s. The public perception was that this was something that deranged fathers did to their daughters, but the feminist movement argued that there were larger issues at play, such as traditional gender roles and patriarchal authority. This caused the perception to shift towards mental illness and psychotherapy suddenly took a larger role in dealing with victims and perpetrators than impartial investigators. It's important to point out that in the 70s, because sexual abuse was almost never spoken about, false accusations were incredibly rare. When someone was accused, the accusations were usually true. A study at the time concluded that 62% of women had suffered sexual abuse in some form. These statistics generalized all forms though, which meant that children abused by their fathers were grouped together with grown women catcalled on the street. However, the media at the time ran these numbers without elaboration and let the public draw their own conclusions about what they meant. Naturally, people assumed the worst, and both journalists and politicians capitalized on that concern. There were even claims that as many as 50,000 children were kidnapped every year, which just wasn't the case at the time. According to the Department of Justice, most cases related to missing children were family abductions, runaways, and forms of disappearance not associated with abduction. But public perception had already been formed. The second factor was the growing concern over cults and Satanism, and here the term demonize is apt. Because of the prevalence of Christianity in Western culture, the concepts of Satan and his demons were often tied to heresy and foreign religions. 
It was also common to use ethnic groups and political ideologies as scapegoats for social turmoil, such as accusing Jews and communists of forming conspiracies to destroy society. But where did all the Satanists come from? The short answer is Hollywood. In the late 60s and early 70s, Hollywood drew audiences with films such as Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist. The Christian fundamentalist movement was growing at the same time with their literal interpretations of the Bible. For them, it wasn't a question of whether Satan was real, but rather in what capacity he was influencing society. So, a combination of Hollywood's use of satanic imagery and the rise of Christian fundamentalism contributed to an increase in public belief that Satan was real. The 60s also introduced new spiritual and religious groups, such as the Moonies and the Hare Krishnas, which were both accused of brainwashing their members. In the 70s, these groups were compared to Charles Manson and the murder of Sharon Tate. There was also the confirmed cult of Jim Jones, where over 900 people committed suicide in Jonestown, Guana in 1978. The term cult was now a real thing and associated with disturbing criminal activity. There were also various occult belief systems entering the public marketplace, such as Wicca and Neopaganism. Actual Satanists were different though. While there were several organized satanic groups, such as the Temple of Set and the Church of Satan, they weren't involved in sexual abuse claims. They were strange and anti-Christian, but not necessarily criminal. Most occult-related crime included mischief such as graffiti, cemetery vandalism and church desecration. These crimes were often perpetrated by white teenage boys as well. Satanism at the time was basically a rebellious fad for the young white male. The third and final factor behind the satanic panic were questionable advancements in the field of psychology. In 1980, the best-selling book Michelle Remembers was published. This book was an account of horrific abuse suffered at the hands of a satanic cult back in 1955, written by Michelle Smith and psychiatrist Dr. Lawrence Pastor. Dr. Pastor also presented a paper at the American Psychiatric Association's annual meeting where he coined the term ritual abuse. However, none of the events depicted in the book were ever verified and the only reasonable explanation was that Michelle Smith's memories had been constructed during her therapy. This is called false memory syndrome. Sigmund Freud had developed the concept of repressed memories, where traumatic experiences are unconsciously forgotten as a coping mechanism. This was a time in history when hypnosis became a fad, with charlatans claiming to be able to help people reconnect with lost memories. No one has been able to verify that even the concept of repression is real, so while it's a concept often spoken about even today, most research psychologists are skeptical that it actually happens in real life. Today, most psychologists use the term dissociative amnesia to refer to repressed memories, but it's still a controversial term because of the problematic consequences it can lead to. One notable example of how this fantasy could be harmful was the McMartin preschool case in Southern California in the 80s. A paranoid mother who was clinically diagnosed with schizophrenia was confident that her son had been abused at his preschool. The authorities took her at her word and called in a professional child abuse interviewer. The boy originally denied an abuse, but then began to admit to it after the interviewer hadn't taken no for an answer. There was no actual evidence against the preschool apart from the boy's testimony, which is now discredited. This became the longest running court case in US history. The preschool received death threats from people across the United States. People even became convinced that there was a giant sex ring in the town itself, and they began to report anything that looked suspicious to the authorities. At its peak, there was a full-blown witch hunt in the town, with countless people falsely accused of sexual abuse. Even Dr. Pastor, the co-author of Michelle Remembers, came to the town to discuss his theory on an international satanic conspiracy being at play. Eventually, the trial ended with hung juries, because there was no actual proof, but the panic continued to spread. Some respected child protection professionals even suggested that anyone expressing skepticism about the trials were agents from the other side. And naturally, when even professionals legitimized the concerns, there was no hope of reducing the panic which spread across the nation. While the general populace was more concerned about the criminal implications of occultism, the religious conservatives were largely focused on the reality of Satan. 
To a Christian, Satanism wasn't just a criminal threat, it was a spiritual attack. Dramatic cultural shifts in the 60s, such as the sexual revolution, supported the Christian view that the United States had lost its cultural morality. The old clashed with the new, and this conflict wasn't just cultural, it was political. A subculture emerged centered on defending conservative moral values as found in traditional literal interpretations of the Bible. These were evangelicals. To the evangelical Christian, conversion is completely transforming, meaning that a Christian must avoid worldly activities and seek out things that are holy. Even things that the Bible never explicitly states as sins were deemed as such, such as smoking, drinking, gambling, cursing, movies and certain forms of music. Sacrificial service and devotion to one's faith called evangelicals to a higher standard than the average religious person. Another focus was on the evangelical family, which was a nuclear family with well-defined gender roles and authority structures. The evangelical family was to be a place of safety and peace where children could be sheltered from worldly influences. The 60s countercultures were attacks against the evangelical so-called traditional values. Christian movements against moral issues have been non-political cultural dissensions in the past. Now, when America had become a godless society, there was a spark of Christian political activism dedicated to halting this moral decline. The sexual revolution was not only an insult to the biblical teachings on sexual ethics, but it also challenged assumptions about women's place in society, and thus the idea of a traditional family. The feminist movement escalated the issue and challenged the desirability of homemaking and child-rearing as fulfilling purposes for a wife or a mother. There was also the legalization of abortion and the removal of prayer and reading of scripture from public schools, as well as entirely new counterculture movements like the New Age movement. The only thing the evangelicals could do at this point to protect their children was to go on the offensive. People like Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell appeared to steer things right, and they even one time televised an episode on Dungeons and Dragons. At first it just simply was a game, just something to do for fun, to pass the time. But it was so intriguing that after, after a short time, it started to become more than just a fun pastime. It started to become more of a, an obsession. Mike Pala had gotten hooked on Dungeons & Dragons, a controversial game of witchcraft where players take on the roles of both good and evil beings. The fascination lay in the use of his mind to invent the treasures and monsters that were a part of the game. Unfortunately for Mike, the border between reality and fantasy was too easily crossed, and before he knew it, his mind had become a prisoner of his own imaginary world. First of all, my school works started slipping. I wasn't doing my homework anymore, and uh, I was spending so much time with my friends that I was neglecting my family and neglecting other, other areas of, of my personal life. Soon, every spare moment was spent either playing the game, buying paraphernalia, or reading and studying the Dungeons & Dragons literature. The more deeply involved Mike became, the less satisfaction he found. Yet something compelled him to keep on, in spite of his growing despondency. A sense of, of depression, a sense of, of, uh, of just an over, overwhelming blackness and, and emptiness swept across me, and, and I, from that, you know, it started to seem as though that the more that I involved myself in the game, the more depressed I started to feel. The dark shadows of the day soon crept into Mike's dreams as wild, grisly nightmares haunted his sleep. I would see just horrific, awful, awful, just bloody and horrible creatures hacking at my friends and and I, would, and I would stand there and watch my friends as they would be just hacked apart and they were just incredibly gory dreams and I would, I would wake up at night, you know, oftentimes, you know, oftentimes I, I'd be so upset that I would not be able to sleep for the rest of the evening. But even those nightmares could not tear Mike away from his obsession with the game. His depression grew more and more intense until one day Mike heard a voice, a voice from hell. It wasn't an audible voice, but I heard a voice speaking in my mind suggesting, why don't you just destroy yourself? Why don't you just do what, what goes on in those dreams? Just destroy yourself, kill yourself. And I seriously considered ways in which, you know, in a sense, planning my suicide, planning ways that I would 
destroy myself. But at, at that time, I had I have a godly mother who saw what the, the game was doing to me, who saw the danger, saw the depression. Well, I felt it was evil. I definitely felt it was evil. He was suicidal, and, and that is really what uh, brought me to seek the help of the Lord, because there was no other way to turn. And I found out that God answers prayer, and that he... Uh, we can prom take his promises from the Bible and apply them to our children's life. And uh, that's when uh, I, I really started praying for him. His mother's prayers are what motivated Mike to attend a Christian fellowship group one day at school. What he found there was a love and acceptance that began to penetrate the darkness in his life. It was after a weekend retreat with the group that Mike finally surrendered to the love of God. I knelt down and I said, Lord, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of the depression and everything that, that's in my life right now. I just give my life to you. I just commit everything to you. And I could feel a sense of pride in my life just being broke. And I felt, my, felt myself actually being humbled. And I, at that moment, at that very instant, the thoughts of suicide left. The depression left instantly. And it wasn't very long after that that I, I took all of my Dungeons and Dragons stuff and threw it out and burned some of it. Mike's darkened spirit came alive. No longer lost in his world of fantasy, Mike has found a new passion, serving the one who turned his life around. As a student at Christ for the Nations Institute in Dallas, Mike is preparing for the ministry, and no one could be more pleased than his mother. Christ means the most to Michael now. He wants to serve the Lord with all his heart. And I thank the Lord for that. Mike still has strong feelings about Dungeons and Dragons. He's careful to warn young people of the subtle danger of the game, telling them it leads down one of two roads, into the occult or suicide. But he also never misses an opportunity to talk about the true source of fulfillment that he's found in Jesus Christ. I love the Lord so much. For, he's done so much for me. He's lifted me out of the depression and he's lifted me out of that. He's given me a reason to live. He's given me a message to share with people, a purpose for living. And he's given me a peace and a joy that just passes all understanding. A peace and a joy that passes all understanding. Some of you watching this program say, listen, uh, this stuff, uh, they just games. Dungeons and Dragons, they just games. These uh, rock uh, musicians, it's just a song, it's games, the uh, cartoons, they, they just uh, sort of make believe. Uh, are they really things like demons? Well, the answer is you better believe it. Evangelicals were concerned about most things in pop culture. They were against rock music because of sexual content, violent and vulgar language, and recurring occult themes, with some bands even hailing Satan. They were against television because it exposed and desensitized children to violence and because of its sexual content. They were against Dungeons and Dragons because of its addictive nature, how they perceived it to cause players to lose a sense of reality and potentially cause suicide, as well as its occult themes and ideas. Christian fundamentalists have a fervent belief that the supernatural is real. While people joke about demonic possession, Christians believe that it exists. They also believe that Satan directly influences the world, causing them to approach new things with discerning eyes. To evangelical Christians, this is a war over the souls of their children. Now when we can contextualize the satanic panic, let's talk more about Dungeons and Dragons and how these two things intersect. In 1980, the public school district of Heber City, a small town in Utah, used D&D in a gifted and talented program to help stimulate imagination, creativity and teamwork among talented children. A community of mostly Mormon parents were concerned about satanic influences in D&D and they brought complaints about it to the local school board. In one meeting, 300 people opposed the game, despite strong support from both players and members of the Parent-Teacher Association. The New York Times covered the story with the headline Utah Parents Exorcise Devilish Game Fomenting Communist Subversion Complaints began right away. The article describes how teachers and school officials were shocked and amused by the community's reaction to their program, which was focused on using D&D to encourage imagination and teamwork. Instead of having been recognized for their efforts, they were 
accused of Satanism and Communism. One minister told a reporter that the game can be very dangerous for anyone involved in it because it leaves them open to real satanic spirits. The article also included a response from Brian Bloom, vice president of TSR Hobbies, who explained that the game was about heroic fantasy and required obstacles for the players to overcome. He said that the things most fun to overcome are things that are evil, foul, rotten and nasty, so we also included some things that were evil, foul, rotten and nasty for that reason. The program ended up being cancelled, a victory for the Mormon parents. This victory emboldened these religious groups. In 1981, the evangelical magazine Christianity Today released an article entitled D&D, a fantasy fad or dabbling in the demonic. After reporting on the game and its popularity, the article relates criticism from evangelicals all over the United States. It points out that D&D was successfully forced out of a summer recreational program of a Sacramento suburb, and that a minister in Hutchinson, Kansas wanted to collect money to buy up and burn every copy he could find of the game. The article also describes how many takes issue with the game's inclusion of supernatural characters, such as demons, harpies, gnomes and witches something which evangelicals claimed encourages occult influences and dabbling with demonic spirits. In the book Painted Black, philosopher and theologian Karl Raschke writes that because there is no exit to the dungeon fashioned brick by brick by the mind, the suicide solution frequently seems the only cogent alternative. The game is one's fate. Like a lair or any other tragic hero, it is not inconceivable that the only conceivable outcome is madness or death. He also states that D&D is an elementary level home study kit for black magic, that the game causes players to go off the deep end and that they are apt to identify with Satan. Another harsh criticism of D&D was published by Jack Schick's Schick Publications in 1984. Dark Dungeons was a comic book style tract about two teenage girls who start playing D&D. It turns out that D&D is an actual cult and the dungeon master recruits the girl to a witch coven and teaches them how to cast real spells. The dungeon monster compels the main character to commit murder to gain her powers as a witch. When one of their characters die in the game, the girl grows depressed and takes her life. The other girl has a demon exorcised by a preacher and is charged with burning all of her D&D books, rock music and occult literature. There are those who are fearful that the game in the hands of vulnerable kids could do harm, and there is evidence that seems to support that view. Timothy Grice, 21. A shotgun suicide. The detective report noted, D&D became a reality. Irving Bink Pulling, 16, an avid D&D player, a suicide. Daniel and Stephen Irwin, 16 and 12, a murder and a suicide. The police said they were obsessed with the game. James Allen Kirby, 14 years old, charged with killing his junior high school principal and wounding three other people. Police are blaming D&D. Jeffrey Jaklovich, 14. Stephen Loyacano, 16. Michael Dempsey, 17. And the list goes on. On June 9, 1982, 16-year-old Irving Bink Polling committed suicide by shooting himself in the chest. After finding out that he had been playing D&D at school, his distraught mother, Patricia Polling, was convinced that the game had been a factor in his suicide. In actuality, Irving had only played nine hours of D&D at school, hardly enough to cause a break from reality. He did suffer from mental illness, though, with classmates testifying that he wasn't well-adjusted and struggled with depression and suicidal thoughts. He also dealt with two parents who were both having affairs. According to an anonymous source, Irving's suicide was an act of aggression towards his mother Patricia. She did not see things this way, though. Patricia Pulling came from a Jewish background, was highly religious, and believed that suicide was a violation of her beliefs. It was unthinkable that her son could have taken his life of his own accord, and she was convinced that he had been influenced by the devil. Because of her belief that tabletop RPGs were evil, they were easy to blame as the tool Satan used to communicate with her son. In her book, The Devil's Web, Who is Stalking Her Children for Satan, she explains that she had found a note with a written curse and assumed that her son had taken it literally and killed himself. The Pullings came home one night three years ago and found Bink, their son, dead on the front lawn of their home in Montpelier, Virginia. He had shot himself through the heart with his father's handgun. Until that night, they had never heard of the game Dungeons & Dragons, 
Then they began looking through his things. We went into the kitchen, and there on the table were the, what we thought were just regular composition books with schoolwork in it, and much of the Dungeons and Dragons material, along with this curse he had received in the game that day that he died. The um, curse the that was placed on Banks' D and D character time. began: "Your soul is mine. I choose the time." In a letter that he left, Banks said he had been summoned to kill himself because he was evil. It was obvious through his writings that he felt. He had assumed this character. But what I couldn't get into my mind was, is it possible? How could anybody do that? How could a 16-year-old that is smart, intelligent, why would they believe that they were something in a game? And why would they kill themselves because somebody else said to do it? Your son was well-adjusted? Always. He had never had psychological problems. He was healthy, even physically healthy. Well, we found that uh, there's been numerous parents who say that uh, uh, the child's had no problems and such. Uh, very conclusively, we go back to details of uh, reports of classmates, of teachers, of friends and such, who very much uh, uh, kind of show that the youngster didn't fit in to school. Uh, he had outside problems and generally problems with his family. Patricia Pulling failed to sue the principal for his son's death. She then failed to sue TSR Hobbies directly. While the courts failed to accept the accusations, the media capitalized on the lawsuits and planted ideas in the public's mind. She gained a lot of support from others and founded the organization Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons, BAD, in 1983. This was an advocacy group that published misleading information about how D&D used demonology, witchcraft, voodoo, murder, rape, blasphemy, suicide, assassination, insanity, sex perversion, homosexuality, prostitution, satanic type rituals, gambling, barbarism, cannibalism, sadism, desecration, demon summoning, necromantics, divination and other such subjects to provoke young people into suicide and violent behavior. She believed that the corrupting nature of tabletop RPGs came from a game master being a person of power and the occult rituals being found in the game's rulebooks. In the latter half of a nearly 40-page pamphlet, Patricia Pulling and her fellow activists compared D&D spells with real-world occult practices to illustrate ties between them. We know that in the case of Dungeons & Dragons, upwards of 3 million kids play the game with no apparent serious consequence that for them it exercises the imagination and is just good fun. But there are those who are afraid that impressionable, vulnerable kids could be harmed by it. Is there Dr. Thomas Rodecki is a psychiatrist who teaches at the University of Illinois Medical School and who is chairman of the National Coalition on Television Violence. He has been studying the game for several years and says there are 28 deaths related to Dungeons & Dragons in the last five years. In some of those it was clearly the decisive element, in other ones it was just a major element in the thinking of the people at the time they committed suicide or, or murder. It's not coincidence, not when you have careful documentation, you have careful notes, you have eyewitnesses. For instance, one case, the parents were actually saw their child summon uh, Dungeons and Dragons demons into his room before he killed himself. Another case, the kid had thought he had the ability to astral travel, coming from the D Dungeons and Dragons game, that he could leave his body and come back. And he had rigged it up just according to the rule book so he could do it. He was surrounded by his materials and put a bullet in his head so he could leave his body, and he's never come back. Patricia Pulling partnered with psychiatrist Thomas Radecki, director of the National Coalition on Television Violence, NCTV, and the two became the strongest organized groups against D&D. Radecki wanted to remove overtly violent images from TV because of the impact they could have on children. When presenting his cases, he sometimes used outright false statistics or cherry-picked what to use. For example, one stated that one in four Hollywood films contained a rape scene which was easily provably false, in one case, he even cited a letter from the fictional film Maces and Monsters to show that D&D had directly caused the death of a player. Radecki appointed Patricia Pulling to help him lead NCTV, and he supported her claims by putting in weight as a psychiatrist. Together, they attempted to have the Federal Trade Commission and the Consumer Protection Agency force TSR to put warning labels on D&D publications. They appealed to congressmen and even appeared on talk shows and current affair programs such as 60 Minutes. Despite having no formal education and only a two-year associate degree in art, 
Patricia Pullen called herself an occult expert and gave public seminars linking D&D to occult crimes, suicides and satanic ritual abuse. She even spoke at events such as national law enforcement conferences. Both she and Radecki appeared several times as expert witnesses in high-profile court cases where defendants claimed that D&D had affected their ability to discern reality. This came to be called the D&D defense and was never successful in trial with the exception for one case with a 14-year-old boy diagnosed with schizophrenia. Bad kept a list of all reported suicides where victims had been associated with D&D, a list of around 150 cases. D&D was shown to be the cause in none of them, but even if it were, it would show a decrease compared to the national average for suicide. Because there were around 4 million players at the time, the national suicide average should have reported 6,840 cases of D&D-linked suicide, and not just 150. But Patricia Pulling used this number as proof that D&D was the leading cause. She was sloppy with statistics when presenting her misleading claims, but this didn't impact the effect she had on police departments. She offered a guide for investigators entitled Interviewing Techniques for Adolescents that was designed to help them know what to do when they suspected a D&D player had committed a crime. In 1989, fantasy author and game designer Michael Stackpole wrote an article entitled Game Hysteria and the Truth, which he followed up in 1990 with the polling report. These articles aim to debunk groups like Bad's mythos surrounding tabletop RPGs, going over Patricia Pauling's blatant misrepresentation of facts, as well as her lack of credentials as an investigator. Stackpole cited sources that included a study from the Center of Disease Control, as well as a study from the American Association of Suicidology, which stated that suicide among teens were no more common in those who played D&D than in those who did not. While Game Hysteria and the Truth focused more on the general claims, the Pulling Report focused on Patricia Pulling specifically. Stackpole pointed out that the first foray into being an occult expert came after she sued the principal of her son's school after her suicide. He also pointed out that her 1987 claim of having been a private investigator for six years was false and that she had only received her private investigator license that same year. He analyzed the guidelines Pulling had written for police departments and pointed out how she never provided evidence for her claims. After the publication of the Pulling report, Patricia Pulling left Bad. After this, Bad's influence began to wane. Because there was no evidence behind their claims, they began to lose support. While Patricia Pulling deserves sympathy for losing her son, she deceived herself until the end. She was looking for someone or something to blame, slipping further into delusion despite overwhelming evidence disproving every claim she made. She died of cancer in 1997. While domestic sexual abuse was a real problem in the 70s, there simply wasn't an evidence of organized satanic infiltration of childcare facilities as people claimed in the 80s. These were moral panics. This is a term coined by Howard S. Becker in 1963 to describe people who create or maintain social norms and who stir social concerns about various issues deemed threatening or evil. According to Becker, there are two groups of moral entrepreneurs, rules creators and rules enforcers. The former establishes social norms while the latter takes action against those who step out of societal norms. When it comes to the satanic panic, we have the concerned parents. It's a parent's job to protect their children, and it's only natural for them to be on guard for anything that could be a threat. While assertions of a game being a significant danger to young people seem absurd to most people, it wasn't absurd to many parents like Patricia Pulling. This was a time when Americans felt under siege by shifting cultural tides that pushed things like drugs, rock music and horror movies that all went against traditional Christian family values. People like Patricia Pulling began to question who should be protecting children, and they arrived at answers ranging from communal efforts to policing children's media or even to actions on the part of the United States government. The concerned parents can be excused for making leaps in logic when wanting to protect their children, but it's really problematic when the professionals legitimize these leaps and when news reporters take them as fact and spread them across the nation. Dr. Pastor was an expert, but he also enjoyed the public attention he got for his important role in uncovering a satanic conspiracy. 
Dr. Radecki was also an expert, but he gave legitimacy to Patricia Pullen's claims while he himself engaged in faulty science. And when it comes to media in particular, first impressions are extremely powerful. When it was proven that Dallas Egbert's disappearance had nothing to do with D&D, the story was already out there and the media had little incentive to de-escalate a situation that earned them views. Moral panics like the satanic panic and the D&D scare all run on urban myths. A false memory syndrome can be used to verify such urban myths. The fear of satanists was a major factor behind the satanic panic spearheaded by misled parents concerned for their children, sparked by events that were misunderstood or misinterpreted and then hyped and sensationalized by the media. It's also important to point out that the ones swallowed up in this were not just the social conservatives, though the movement leaders often were, but no, the panic spread to all parts of society. And there are moral panics still today targeting new groups as perceived threats. The D&D scare and other anti-gaming panics were started by religious parents like Patricia Polling, but these were just some moral panics in a sea of others. Anti-drug campaigns, fear surrounding violence on television. There were many parent-driven movements aimed to protecting the American youth from perceived evils, and this continues to this day. But the claim that these moral crises are mainly caused by religion fails to consider broader parental movements, many of which are secular. For example, the Parents Music Resource Center, PMRC, aimed to protect children from sexualized music. PMRC, BAD and other groups often use television to garner support for their moral panic, such as how PMRC used television to pressure Congress to have a hearing on the content of music in 1985. In another example, the Partnership for a Drug-Free America was known for their Any Questions PSA, where they likened the brain on drugs to a frying egg. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? A concerned parent didn't have to go further than their living room to be exposed to moral panics about the dangers of a shifting culture. While there certainly were real dangers out there, such as a rising crime rate, the conflation of these with Satanism and tabletop RPGs were constructions. In 1994, an article pointed out that if people who were speaking out about D&D were correct, there would be many more suicides and violent incidents in the role-playing community. Though that same article did report that D&D players tended to report higher levels of alienation, it also pointed out that further research was needed to explore whether intense role-playing caused players to become alienated or whether intense players were already alienated prior to playing. It was possible that the feelings expressed by the players in the study were no different than the feelings of other individuals who were intensely committed to other recreational activities. There was also a study made in 1995 where the goal was to find connections between D&D players and those dabbling in Satanism. It didn't find any such connections, instead discovering that fantasy gamers had significant differences to satanic dabblers. The conclusion of these articles was that D&D is no more likely to be dangerous than a book or a movie. As a matter of fact, researchers have found evidence linking tabletop RPGs to improved mental health, with games being used in therapeutic environments to help both children and adults. High-risk children appear to have improved socially, emotionally and intellectually through the use of D&D as a safe environment for learning. In England, the Surrey County Schools Inspector for English and Drama had students compete in a D&D competition reporting that the teachers were impressed by how the game showed the kids' ability to develop socially with clear communication and character analysis. In fact, tabletop RPGs have proven effective in helping even people with more complex psychological conditions. A case report from Dr. Wayne D. Blackmon details how a 19-year-old college student diagnosed with free-floating depression, suicidal tendencies and schizoid nature underwent months of formal therapy from multiple psychiatrists without any positive benefits. He was then introduced to D&D, which helped him develop complete characters with emotions he couldn't express on his own. As the other players consciously used the game as a means of therapy, his own demons were brought to light within an environment that was both comfortable and safe. 
In this case, D&D succeeded at something individual therapy had failed at. It could help a person reflect on their emotions and identity using imagined characters as a medium for thought. Today, the use of tabletop RPGs in therapy is more accepted than ever before. Non-profit organization game to grow develops games specifically to help those struggling with autism spectrum disorder and social anxiety. They were launched through a successful crowdfunding campaign aimed to provide therapeutic and educational gaming groups that contribute to the growth of communities and promote an understanding of the power and benefit of games across the world. Their game Critical Core is also helpful in anger management and in increasing empathy and happiness, all while promoting fun and cooperative interaction. But RPGs can also be a very inclusive hobby, something that surprised Tanya DePass, founder and director of a Chicago-based nonprofit called I Need Diverse Games. Of course, not every game setting depicts a perfect world, but fantasy worlds like those in D&D are disconnected enough from reality that the racial structures of real life don't have to be seen in that same context. Immersive games like D&D can empower individual players and help them combat the self-loathing that some may feel after being persecuted by others for things that set them apart. I myself did a study on the therapeutic applications of tabletop RPGs back in 2020 where I interviewed several licensed practitioners who used the game in therapeutic settings. If you're interested in learning more about this, I do have a video on the subject. Tabletop RPGs have nothing to do with beliefs, gender, race or satanism. They supply a welcoming space for players where every campaign is unique and tailored to personal experiences. In some cases they can be more therapeutic than traditional practices or prescription drugs. A tabletop RPG can help a player look inside themselves, bond with others and critically think about situations that can reflect upon real life. It helps the player train empathy as they get to walk in someone else's shoes and try to understand the feelings of someone other than themselves. Finally, tabletop RPGs is a form of escape. Traditionally, the idea of escapism has had negative connotations. It insinuates that someone tries to live in an imaginary world and tries to avoid dealing with real-life issues or situations. However, escapism is a natural part of the human experience. People practice escapism when immersing themselves in a television show or when in deep conversation. J.R.R. Tolkien called escapism the escape of the prisoner rather than the flight of a deserter. He said, Why should a man be scorned if, finding himself in a prison, he tries to get out and go home? Or if, when he cannot do so, he thinks about and talks about other topics than jailers and prison walls? The world outside does not become less real because the prisoner cannot see it. Tolkien believed that immersion in literature or other means could be therapeutic as it allowed one to, for a moment, escape the pressures of life. But escapism doesn't only take you away from something else, it adds something new. Power structures are rearranged, social contracts are rewritten and even moralities are changed and reimagined. These stories don't just provide temporary escape, but they add context and meaning for you to evaluate. Much has happened to tabletop RPGs and to D&D in its almost 50 years. It survived the moral panics of the 80s and 90s, having gone from a satanic product causing teen suicides to become a wholesome activity applauded for its pedagogical and social benefits. Back in 1983, interest in fantasy was characterized as limited hardcore nerds, those who didn't meet or adhere to many of the normative requirements of conventional society. That was 1983. In 2019, the online streaming show Critical Role held a live show in Los Angeles called The Search for Grog, which sold out thousands of seats within a matter of hours. Critical Role in particular has broadened interest in D&D and in tabletop RPGs in general since their debut in 2015. There's reason to argue that D&D's success was not in spite of, but because of the moral panic surrounding the game. The early 80s saw a drastic increase in customers, and many of these were likely curious teens and young adults who wanted to see what the outrage was about. Bad, who wanted to keep children from these games, instead increased the popularity of them. Unlike larger organizations like PMRC, who managed to enact actual change, Bad only influenced certain individual parents and local groups. While some school districts banned the game, there was no lasting legislation. 
that a hobby could be a satanic cult is a joke made by many gamers today. It's more popular than ever before, much thanks to people like Patricia Pulling. I think that looking at this story, the history of tabletop RPGs, as well as the rise and fall of the satanic panic, helps us to better appreciate the games we play. It's important to remember though that the satanic panic was a product of its time, but it was only one moral panic in a sea of others. Today new moral panics are at full display and social media has played a bigger role than the media in spreading destructive ideas to people who are susceptible to them, and everyone is susceptible to some degrees. What you can do is to be aware of the things around you, critical of the news and opinions that enter your feed, and focus on being the best person you can be for yourself and for others. Players of tabletop RPGs used to feel alienated, but we don't need to feel that way anymore. Be kind, be inclusive, be your best self, and show people that this is the best hobby in the world. Also, as a final point to end the video on, Hail Satan.